Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to have Ivanka come to do the reading. And if you don't know, if you haven't heard about MIT Brazil, and basically we're part of NIST, the MIT International Science and Technology Initiative. So we are 17 different countries. Basically, I'm in charge of Brazil. I'm known as Brazil around here, uh, or before CIS, that's my name. <laughs> Nobody knows who they call me Brazil. But we uh, mainly send students from MIT and try to connect faculty, MIT faculty to Brazil, Brazilian um, researchers and faculty. So welcome everybody, and I will ask um, Renato to do the introduction of our year. I assume I have to go to this microphone. Yes, that, that's easier because the other one is mo monopolized by our <laughs> <laughs> So it, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce Jacques Fuchs. I have just a very brief remarks. Uh, I might start by saying that Jacques, he has recently won the Sao Paulo Prize for Literature in the category of Young Writer. And this is currently the biggest uh, liter literary prize in Brazil and considered as equivalent to the Man Booker Prize in the Portuguese language. Just to give you an idea uh, of how important this prize is, as the people who protest in the Occupy movement would say, would have said, Jacques folks is now a one percenter in Brazil, <laughs> just because of what he has won with this prize. So that's amazing, you see, that's, uh, and he did that without going to the financial market. Yeah. So he, he I bought see, two Ferraris, right? Two Ferraris, no, well, you're still, it's in your endowment, the last time I heard, <laughs> try to rival with MIT and Harvard. So let me also highlight that it's especially good to host Jacques here at MIT because he comes from an unusual background, a background that we care deeply here. Jacques has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a master's degree in computer science from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, also known as UFMG. Later, he proceeded to do two doctorates, one in comparative literature and another in French language, literature, and civilization, and is currently a visiting scholar at Harvard University. As MIT undergraduates know, and I can see some of them here, it's very important to have training both in humanities as well as in the so-called hard science. However, outside of MIT, this mixture is not so common. Jacques Fuchs is a great example of the intellectual benefits and creativity allowed by combining these different backgrounds. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from the award-winning both antitherapies in Portuguese with the English translation read by Ernest Hartwell. As you, you will hear, Antitherapia has a background as a small Jewish community in the 21st century Brazil. Testimonies, Jewish culture, and literature are reflected in this fast-paced account, a coming-of-age narrative with very great sense of humor. So, without further ado, let me welcome Jacques Fuchs and Ernest Hartwell. before we start our reading. So this book is a fiction, although there are like many autobiographical, auto, like personal moments of my life, of my personal life, it's a fiction. I have like many problems in Brazil because of that. So people like, they, they found their, their selves inside the book, so they keep like complaining about the book. So, but it's a fiction book. People who know more about literature know that uh, we, we can do those things in literature. <laughs> so, uh, this, book, this book deals with the problem of memory. So, when we keep like, trying to, to remember things, we, we try to, to, to understand our past, but it's not uh, perfect this understanding. So we keep like trying to, you know, to, to invent some moments. So this book talks about the, those inventions as well. And also it's, uh, it's about this Jewish boy and this 
Brazilian Jewish community, which is very small. I'm from a, a city called Belo Horizonte, which is a very, it's a big city, but uh, which, is, which has a small Jewish community, just 2,000 people. So this book talks about this Jewish community. And also there are like many jokes, but as you know, jokes are like very complicated and very like, there are many things behind those jokes. So I'm gonna be reading uh, in English, and my friend Ernest will be reading in, I'll be reading in Portuguese. So, uh, and my friend Ernest will be reading in English. So it's gonna take like 20 minutes maybe, and then we can like discuss or comment some parts. So, hope you like it. Malditos nazistas. Eichmann, Bormann, Argentina, Brasil. Agora tudo faz sentido, tudo se encaixa. Eu era uma criança normal. Normal com todas as peculiaridades de uma criança judia que vivia nos guetos modernos. Eu tinha minha mãe e meu pai judeus, meus amigos judeus, meus parentes judeus, minha escola judia, o clube judeu, e naquela época até pensava que o show da Xuxa era um programa caché. Eram muitos úteros me protegendo. O primeiro deles eu consegui romper, como todo mundo, a duras penas. Sinto que depois de sair daquele lugar quentinho, úmido, confortável e seguro, ainda o procuro sempre, tomei meu primeiro pé na bunda. Na verdade, anos depois, vejo que foi só um tapinha na bunda, no estilo Michelangelo, já que eu era de fato uma obra-prima e que devia falar. Mas mamãe logo me deu carinho, afeto, proteção e muito leite. E eu nem precisava chorar, teria tudo. Então nem sofri tanto com esse meu primeiro pontapé. Uma semana depois cortaram meu prepúcio, brito milagre, meu pacto com o povo escolhido e minha imunidade em relação à maldosa Lilith. Se é que Deus e Lilith existem. Ou será que a circuncisão é realizada para se ter certeza de, de estar sempre incompleto? A quem completude já é física, não há mais nada a fazer. Nunca ouvi falar em implante de prepúcio. E nunca ouvi falar em alguém que o desejasse. A verdade é que deve ter doído muito. Devo ter me assustado bastante com aquele tanto de gente comendo e bebendo de graça. Onde tem comida e bebida de graça e douradeia, tem judeus de sobra. Principalmente aqueles parentes que provavelmente só apareceram no meu brito milá e no meu bar mitzvah. Observavam a mim e a meu pipiu original. Tão pequenininhos nós dois, pelo menos um deles cresceu, e nem foi muito. E ainda molharam meu bico no vinho para me ludibrificar, ludibriar, em vino veritas. Logo depois, literalmente, me castraram. A castração, plagiando por antecipação as teorias freudianas, era de, de fato a verdade. Alguns psicanalistas extremistas consideram o rito do Brit Milá como a automutilação do povo judeu e seria essa uma das explicações para o antissemitismo. Eu não sei de nada, mas desconfio de muita coisa. Não me lembro de nada. Aqui já me inseria na história, na história de Abraão e de seu pacto com Deus, na literatura medieval judaica, com a invenção de Lilith e dos Dibuks. A minha, a minha própria história começava a copiar a literatura. Podia estar, en, encontrar em mim os primeiros sintomas do complexo de Portnoy. Fascinante! Que a história tivesse copiado a história já era suficientemente assombroso. Que a história copiasse a literatura era inconcebível. Mas mesmo assim, a minha história continuava. Damn Nazis, Eichmann, Bormann... Argentina, Brazil, now everything makes sense, considering it's Brazil. I was a normal child, normal with all the peculiarities of a Jewish child who is living in a modern ghetto. I had my Jewish mother and Jewish father, my Jewish friends, my Jewish school, the Jewish club, and back then I even thought Jusha's show was a kosher program. Many wounds protected me. Like everyone, I had a great difficulty delivering myself from the original uterus. I think I received my first kick in the butt after leaving that warm, humid, comfortable, safe place, which I always see. Years later, I saw that it was only a little Michelangelo-style tap in the butt, telling me I was in fact a masterpiece and I ought to parari. But mom soon gave me care, affection, protection, and a lot of milk. I didn't even need to cry. I would have, every I would have everything. 
So, I didn't even suffer much as a result of that first kick. A week later, they cut my foreskin. Brit Milah, my pact with the chosen people and my immunity to the evil of Lilith, if God and Lilith actually exist. Or is the circumcision performed to create certainty that one will always be incomplete? Since he is already physically incomplete, there isn't anything to be uh, done about it. I've never heard of a foreskin implant, and I've never heard it said that anyone wanted one. In truth, it must have hurt a lot. I must have been really scared with all those people eating and drinking for free, where there's free food and drink and someone else's pain, Jews aplenty, principally those relatives who probably only appeared at my Brit Milah and my Bar Mitzvah. They observed me and my original PP, so tiny both of us. At least one of them grew, though not much. They even dipped my beak into wine to trick me, in vino veritas. A little while later, they castrated me. The castration, an anticipatory plagiarizing of Freudian theory, was actually the truth. Some extremist psychoanalysts consider the right of Brit Milat to be self-mutilation of the Jewish people and offer it as a one explanation for some anti-Semitism. I don't know anything, but I mistrust a lot. I remember nothing, yet I have already injected myself into history, into the story of Abraham and his pact with God, into medieval Jewish literature with its invention of Lilith and the Dibuks. My own story has begun to imitate literature. I could see myself exhibiting the first symptoms of the Portnoy complex. Fascinating. That a story could copy history was already sufficiently astonishing. That a story could copy literature was inconceivable. But, despite this, my story continued. Nas nossas mães eram espertas. E desmamas sabiam matematicamente quando o filhinho querido e perfeito poderia trazer algum problema. E acho que era isso que, era isso que as chicas se mudavam tanto com tanta frequência da minha casa. Mudavam também de estilo, antes com certo sex appeal, depois com nenhum, nenhum sequer. Maior, lembro-me de discutir sobre as chicas com meus amigos. Alguns tinham histórias assim como eu. Não sei se consumaram o fato, eu não. Mas a partir do momento que nossas idish mamas se convenciam de que estávamos crescendo, não bastante para ficarmos longe delas, isso nunca, talvez com 86 anos, de que poderíamos copular, elas logo se reuniam e faziam complôs contra a nossa juventude e imaginação. As chicas partiam. Elas encontravam chicas que, que não mais ofereciam perigo. Acredito que existe uma sociedade secreta das mães, num estilo bem moçado. Não com o objetivo de assegurar a existência do Estado judeu, mas de assegurar o bem-estar psíquico, financeiro, social, sexual e cultural da prole judaica, dos filhos perfeitos. E esse Mossad materno deve ter encontros secretos, clandestinos, perigosos, com mensagens secretas, cifradas e de suma importância escondidas em receitas de bolo e gefilte fish. Lembro-me de uma visita a um parque de diversões com a mamãe. Eu fui tentar ganhar um prêmio naqueles brinquedos onde atirávamos com pistolas de ar comprimido. A gente não acertava quase nada e, apesar do meu esforço, não fui recompensado. Mas minha mãe, minha mãe pediu a vez. Ela deve ter ficado muito comovida pela minha frustração. Lá no manual da mãe Mossad, os filhos nunca se frustram. E naquele momento, ela tinha que acabar com esse meu sentimento. Assim o fez. Com a pistola de ar comprimido, acertou todos os alvos, sem errar nenhum. Uma tiradora de elite. Da elite do Mossad materno. Nunca soube se foi sorte ou fruto de um treinamento exaustivo fornecido pelo Centro de Inteligência das Idas Mamas. Nunca soube se esse episódio ocorreu. Lembro, invento. Mas ela acertou e me poupou de uma frustração. Espantado, perguntei-lhe onde tinha aprendido a atirar tão bem, com tanta precisão. Ela me disse ter ganhado um campeonato de tiro quando jovem. Eu não me, de, não me deu mais informações. Também nunca mais soube. Mas fantasi, fantasiei e fantasio bastante. Talvez minha mãe seja um dos generais dessa liga secreta, milenária e inativa. Capacidade ela tem, posso garantir. E por isso ela me privou e baixou ordem a todas as outras mães dessa corporação secreta para que fizessem mesmo dos encantos das chicas. As idas mamas não queriam netos bastardos, nem desejavam que os filhos partissem. Ainda não desejam. 
Assim, durante nossa tenda infância, prazeres e jogos sexuais permeavam o nosso imaginário. Alguns amigos tiveram relações sexuais com as tizas. Alguns romancearam essas relações. Alguns inventaram e imaginaram. Isso não mais importa. A distância, o esquecimento e a literatura são as únicas presentes no momento do testemunho. Momentos, prazeres, lembranças, recriações. But our mothers were skilled. Yiddish mothers knew mathematically when a little boy wanted and perfect would be able to cause a problem. I think that this was why shiksas changed with such frequency at my house. They also changed in style. At first they had a certain sex appeal, later none, not even a little. When I got a little older, I remember talking about the shiksas with my friend. Some had stories like mine. I don't know if they consummated the act. Me, no. But from the moment that our Yiddish mothers realized we were growing up, not enough for us to be far away from them, never, maybe at 86 years of age, and that we would be able to have sex, they soon met and conspired <coughs> against our youth and imagination. The shiksas departed. They hired new shiksas who presented no danger. I believe a secret society of our mothers exists something like the Mossad. Not for the objective of protecting the well-being of the Jewish state, but to secure physical, financial, social, sexual, and cultural security for the Jewish people of the perfect children. And this maternal Mossad must have secret meetings, clandestine, dangerous, with secret encrypted message, messages of ultimate importance, hidden in the recipes of cakes and gefilte fish. I remember a scene at an amusement park with my mother. I was trying to win in one of those games where we shot air guns. I hardly hit a thing. And despite my effort, I didn't win anything. But my mother asked for a turn. She must have been very moved by my frustration. There, in the mother's Mossad manual, the children never suffer frustration. And at that moment, she had to bring my frustrations to an end, so she did. She hit all the targets with that air gun. Didn't miss one. An expert shot of the elite mother's Mossad. I never found out if it was luck or the result of an exhaustive training provided by the intelligence service of the Yiddish, mother, Yiddish mamas, the Yiddish mothers. I never knew if this episode really occurred. I remember, I invent. But she succeeded and saved me from frustration. Amazed. I asked her where she learned to shoot so well and with such precision. She told me she'd won a shooting contest when she was young. She never told me more. So I never learned more, but I fantasized and imagined enough. Maybe my mother was one of the generals of that secret thousand-year-old league and was still active. She was capable of it, I can guarantee that. And thus she deprived me of the charms of the shiksas and ordered all the other mothers of the secret organization to do the same. Yiddish mothers don't want bastard grandchildren. They didn't even want the children to leave. They still don't. Thus, during our tender childhood years, sexual pleasures and games permeated our imaginations. Some friends had sexual relationships with shiksas. Some wrote fictional stories about these relationships. Some invented and imagined them. That is no longer important. The distance, the forgetting, and the literature are the only ones that are present in the memory of testimony. Moments, pleasures, remembrances, recreations. Cheguei da aula decidido a praticar o que tinha ouvido pelos corredores. Este seria meu Bloomsday. Não pensava muito no mistério das coisas. Eu precisava agir, escondido. Liguei o chuveiro e deixei a água cair. Fui pensando em minhas coleguinhas. Em suas coxas, bundas, coxas, bundas, coxas, bundas, lábios, línguas, unhas, cheiros, vulvas, céus, terras, terrestres, infernais. E estava diante do mistério do deleite. O que eu iria descobrir? Iria ficar ali me masturbando pra, eternamente? Acho que nem sabia do tal do orgasmo, do gozo. Fui praticando, exercitando, esperando ansiosamente o desfecho brilhante daquela minha ficção. Soletrava meu destino completo. Paixão, volúpia, dor, vida, morte, sonhando, beijando e analisa analisando seus traseiros marmórios. Que lindo era o traseiro marmório do mundo das ideias. A bundinha perfeita. Tinha fé e certeza instintiva de que algo poderoso passaria pelo meu corpo, meus órgãos, meu falo. 
que mudaria as sensações até então vividas. Senti tudo de todas as maneiras. E aconteceu, sublime, sensação de prazer, liberdade, poder, relaxamento. Nasci aí o jovem artista. E nasceu também a arte e o sentimento da vida. Trabalhava a respiração e a inspiração. A inspiração pela bunda, a bunda, só a bunda existia, o resto era imagem, entidade, doutrina, culto, encantamento, sonho, perfeição platônica, a bunda das ideias, o mundo das bundas, e eu tinha fome de conhecimento pelo gozo. Como tinha meus 11 anos, as bundinhas eram pequenininhas, redondinhas. Na aula de educação física, elas ainda ficavam ainda mais bem modeladas, as, as bundinhas coladas. A maior invenção do homem depois da roda foi a calça colada. No corpo feminino, esse retiro, a doce bunda, é ainda o que prefiro. A ela, meu mais íntimo suspiro, pois tanto mais a palco quanto a miro. E no banheiro eu me imaginava tirando as calças, bermudas, shorts. Era tudo tão lindo, tão imaginativo. Estava novamente imitando a poesia ou a poesia me imitava e plagiava. A história já começava deste ponto incrível. A bunda se libertando para os meus prazeres. Bunda mel, bunda alias, bunda cor, bunda mor, bunda lei, bunda dor, bunda nil, bunda pão, bunda de mil versões, pluribunda, unibunda, bunda em flor, bunda em al, bunda lunar e sol, bunda rio. Não tinha que imaginar toda essa história para chegar a essa parte. Aqui nada de romantismo, nada de flores, de versos, de votos de amor. Nem concebi o que devia ser feito, de fato, me expor consentido e voluntariamente à bunda de uma colega. Isso estava num plano impossível, além do mundo das ideias, já que para que ela existisse num plano superior, era necessária uma versão no plano terreno. E essa versão eu nem podia imaginar. Por isso, gostava tanto da atividade masturbatória, o erotismo. Malditos nazistas, será que a minha expressão de dor durante o meu espancamento era similar à expressão do meu gozo? Eu apanhava e estava certa de que, a cada murro e chute, mais e mais judeu eu me tornava. Era um misto de prazer e dor. O sangue quente, que muito escorria até as comissuras de minha boca, tinha um cheiro forte. Saía das minhas entranhas como um gozo. Pequenas mortes. I arrived from class, determined to practice what I heard about in the hallways. This would be my balloon's day. I didn't think much about the mystery of things. It was necessary to act, hidden. I turned on the shower and let the water run. I thought about the girls at school, about their thighs, butts, thighs, butts, thighs, butts, lips, tongues, fingernails, smells, vulvas, heaven, earth, hell. And I was face to face with a mystery of delight. What was I going to discover? Would I stay there masturbating forever? I don't think I even knew about orgasm, about pleasure. I was practicing, nervously awaiting the brilliant ending of my, to my fiction. I spelled out my fate completely, passion, pleasure, pain, life, and death, dreaming, kissing, and analyzing their marble butts. How lovely was the marble butt of the world of ideas, the perfect butt. I had faith and instinctive certainty that something powerful would pass through my body, my organs, my penis, what would change the sensations until then vivid, to feel everything in every way. And it happened. Sublime. The feeling of pleasure, freedom, power, relaxation. Born there, the young artist. And born too, the art and the sense of life. I worked at respiration and inspiration. Inspiration through the butt. The butt. Only the butt existed. The rest was a mirage. Being, doctrine, cult, enchantment, dream, platonic perfection, the butt of ideas, the world of the butt. And I had hunger for knowledge of pleasure. Since I was 11, the butts were small. Little round butts. In gym class, they were nicely displayed. The tight Bermudas, the greatest invention of mankind after the wheel was the tight pan. I still prefer this treatment of the female body with a nice butt. I privately sigh as much to touch it as to admire it. And in the bathroom, I imagined pulling off the pants, Bermuda shorts. It was all too beautiful, too imaginative. Was I again imitating poetry, or was poetry imitating and plagiarizing me? The story just began from this incredible point. The butt surrendering itself for my pleasures. Butt honey, butt a fool. Butt color, butt love, butt law, butt galore, butt a much, butt bread, butt a touch. A thousand versions of butt. Plura butt, una butt, button flower, button the butt lunar, and the butt solar. 
I didn't have to imagine all of history to arrive here. Nothing of romanticism, nothing of flowers, verses, professions of love. I didn't imagine what I would be willing to do in reality to expose myself, consenting involuntarily to the butt of a classmate. That was an impossible goal, beyond the imagination. But the butt existed on a superior plane. An earthbound butt would still be necessary, and I couldn't even imagine such a plan. For that reason, I liked the activity of masturbation too much. Eroticism. Damn Nazis. Was my expression of pain during my beating similar to the expression of my pleasure? I got a beating and was certain that with each punch and kick I became more and more Jewish. It was a mixture of pleasure and pain. The warm blood that ran to the corners of my mouth had a strong taste. It left my insides like joy. Small death. Meu primeiro dia de, o meu primeiro dia fora desse útero judaico foi uma desgraça. Se todos os dias posteriores tivessem sido como aquele, teria pedido ao mundo para que parasse, para eu descer. Minha mãe e a mãe do meu, do meu irmão Bernardo tinham escolhido para nós a melhor escola da cidade. Óbvio. Mesmo assim era pouco. Uma escola católica franciscana. Elas decidiram nos empenhar por transporte escolar. Uma forma de interação com o mundo goi da inserção e assimilação. E o primeiro dia de aula chegou. A aula começaria uma da tarde. Ao meio-dia deveria estar pronto para ser buscado. Almoçado, cabelo penteado, camisa para dentro da calça, ao estar amarrado. Naquela época, ao estar não era coisa de gente alternativa, não. Pelo contrário, ao estar junto com a Havaianas, era coisa do povo, do povão, de Sinão de Ramos. Mas mamãe assim me vestia, e era assim que eu deveria me vestir. Meias limpas, bermuda marrom, camisa branca com o símbolo CSA, mochila com todos os livros, nomes no caderno, tudo pronto. Lembro-me ainda do medo diante do desconhecido, do imponderável, do recomeço de uma nova vida, do espanto frente ao futuro que deveria ser vivido. Desci à espera do transporte escolar. Aflito, Bernardo, próximo de minha casa, deve ter sentido o mesmo que eu, sem falar, sem muito mostrar seu sofrimento. Esperamos infindáveis minutos. Minha mãe acompanhava minha angústia pela janela. O transporte não chegava. Caos, confusão. Nunca é bom sair de casa no primeiro dia escolar. Deveria ser feriado. O carro chegou finalmente, uma da tarde. Atrasado, muito atrasado. A motorista, louca, disse que não daria tempo de buscar o Bernardo. Minha mãe se desesperou. Fui com o transporte escolar em pânico para a escola que já começara. Minha mãe foi, em pânico, buscar o Bernardo para levá-lo. Logística perfeita. Será que o colégio tinha algum acordo com o transporte escolar? Não seria punido por atraso? Já pegaria uma suspensão no primeiro dia letivo? Descobririam que um judeuzinho, daqueles culpados injustamente pelo decídio, já estava atrapalhando novamente o mundo católico, atrasado, atrasando. O que seria de mim? Converteriam-me à força? Já beberia neste primeiro dia o sangue e o corpo do outro judeuzinho? Puta que pariu, eu estava fudido. Com força. E, era aquele que não que... e eu era aquele que não queria ser notado, que só queria passar margeando a vida. Quieto, retraído, tímido. Descobri depois que o tímido era aquele que, diante de sua certeza de ser melhor do que todos e de que tudo, não queria interagir com o mundo. Era eu mesmo naquele instante. Esse brave new world não era para mim. Onde estava a mamãe para me proteger? Para que se completasse as ironias do dia, o transporte escolar estragou no meio do caminho. Isso sim era uma pedra no meio do caminho, do meu caminho, da minha vida. E a uma e meia, já deveras atrasada, tivemos que pegar um táxi. Dois táxis. Outros meninos compartilhavam a minha agonia. Mas agora que estavam mais tranquilos do que eu. Meu pânico era tanto que, ne, que eu nem o lembrava mais dos outros meninos. Será que eles sentiam uma pequena parcela do que senti? Coitados, coitado de mim. Cheguei à aula duas da tarde, portão fechado, deixaram-me entrar. Minha cara de choro, pavor, medo, era mais visível do que um outdoor. Procurei minha sala, colégio gigante. No meu antigo colégio havia uma sala para cada ano, com no máximo sete alunos. Ali na quinta série tinha oito salas, cada uma com 50 alunos, todos goinhos. Achei finalmente a quinta série. Ah, entrei. Nem sei como consegui entrar, ne, en, enfrentar esse momento. Mesmo agora, escrevendo com a distância e talvez com certo entendimento e esquecimento do passado, tenho vontade de fugir, de me esconder, 
de voltar para a escola judaica onde era amigo do rei, mas era preciso ter coragem. Sem vontade, adentrei em minha sala. E não fui muito bem recebido. Primeiro pela professora, que se assemelhava, se assemelhava a um bulldog já com a idade avançada. Olhou-me com olhos de morte, de desprezo, de censura, da vontade de punir, matar, trucidar. Essa foi minha sensação, acho que não foi tanto assim. Depois, 50 olhares me analisaram. Do Alstar até meu cabelo no estilo super nerd, um super nerd. 50 olhares, todos os olhares do mundo naquele instante. Acho que eu nem era capaz de pensar, muito menos de sentir. Pois pensava e sentia tudo, todos. Só me faltava o tapa na bunda dado pelo médico me dizendo para nascer, viver, parlar. E eu vi naquele instante, eu vivi naquele instante, foi preciso, era preciso. A professora, após me censurar pelo meu atraso, até pensei em contar toda a história da minha vida, meus sofrimentos, vitórias e derrotas até aquele instante, mas eu não consegui pronunciar nenhuma palavra sequer. Permitiu que eu entrasse. Mas não havia lugares na sala. Todos estavam ocupados por crianças malévolas, filhos de Lilith. Meu Deus! Ou uma mãe que devia estar acompanhando o iniciente à minha primeira aprovação levantou a mão de um anjo o meu anjo, o meu Virgílio, que eu sempre me conduziu, que escolhi para me conduzir nas dificuldades. Acho que essa, foi até, essa mão foi até iluminada por um raio celeste. Que, alegraria, que, ale, que alegria ver aquele braço levantado. Era o Bernardo, que já tinha chegado à aula trazido pela minha mãe e, por sorte do destino, estava na minha sala, sentado na última carteira, sozinho, ansioso pela minha chegada, para o, meu, para o seu lado me dirigir. Querer lhe dar um abraço, um beijo, chorar em seu ombro, lamentar ter que viver, ter que seguir a vida, assim desprotegido. Ele seria, a partir desse instante, meu protetor também no colégio. Meu ombro amigo, meu ombro irmão, o irmão. E lado a lado ficamos juntos, mudos. Eu nunca soube o que o Bernardo sentiu naquele dia. My first day out of this uterus was a disgrace. If all the days that followed had been like that, I would have asked the world to stop so I could get off. My mother and my mother, and the mother of my brother, Bernardo, had chosen for us the best school in the city, obviously, even though it was little, a Franciscan Catholic school. They decided to send us to school on the bus. It would allow us to interact with the Goy world, to immerse and assimilate. And the first day of school arrived. School started at one. At noon, we were to be ready, bed, hair combed, shirt tucked in, all-stars tied. At that time, all-stars weren't worn by alternative types. On the contrary, all-stars and avayanas were worn by the people, the masses. <coughs> But mom was still dressing me, and that was how she dressed me. Clean socks, maroon bermudas, white shirt with a CSA insignia, backpack filled with books, names written in the notebooks, everything ready. I still remember the fear of the unknown of the unknowable, of starting a new life, a fear in the face of the life that must be lived. I descended to wait for the school's car to pick me up, afflicted. Bernardo, a neighbor, must have felt the same as me, without saying much, without showing much, distress. We waited endlessly. My mother watched my anguish from the window. The ride hadn't come. Chaos, confusion. It is never a good idea to leave the house on the first day of school. It should have been a holiday. Finally, the car arrived, one, late. The crazy driver said we didn't have time to look for Bernardo. My mother was furious, confusion. I rode off in the car, in a panic, to, to a school that had already begun. My mother, panicked, looked for Bernardo to take him to school. Perfect logic. Could it be that the school had an understanding with the transporter? Wouldn't I be punished for arriving late? Would I earn a suspension on my first day of school? I discovered that a Jewish boy, one of those guilty of killing God, was still disturbing the Catholic world. Late, late, what would become of me? Would I be forcibly converted? Would I have to drink the blood and eat the body of another Jew on the first day? Son of a bitch, I'm fucked. Forcibly. I just didn't want to be noticed. So, I could just live my life on the fringes. Quiet, withdrawn, shy. I later discovered that despite a certainty of being better than everyone and everything else, a shy person didn't want to interact with the world. That was me at that moment. That brave new world wasn't for me. Where was my mother to protect me? 
On top of everything else, the school's car broke down on the way, on my way, in the middle of my life. And at 1.30, already late, we would have to get out of the taxi, we would have to get a taxi, two taxis. Other children were sharing my predicament, but I think they were calmer than I. I was so panicked, I don't remember much about the other children. Did they feel even a small friction of my agony? Poor kids, poor me. I arrived at school at 2. The door was locked. They let me in. My tear-streaked, terror-stricken face was more revealing than a billboard. I found my classroom. Huge school. In my old school, we had one room for the whole year, with at most seven students. There, in the fifth grade, there were eight classrooms, each with 50 students. Goyim. I finally got to the fifth grade. I entered. I had no idea how to face this moment. Even now, writing with distance and maybe with a certain understanding and forgetting of the past, I still have to urge I still have the urge to flee, to hide, to return to the Jewish school where I was a king, where I was king. But I needed to be brave. Against my wishes, I entered the classroom and I was not well received. First by the teacher, who looked like an aged bulldog. She looked at me with the eyes of death, disdain, censor, the desire to punish, to kill, to kill and to eat me. That was my impression, and I don't think it was far from the truth. Then 50 pairs of eyes studied me. From my all-stars to my hair combed to the side in the style of Superman, or super nerd. Fifty pairs of eyes. At that moment, all the eyes in the world. I don't think I could even think, much less feel. Then I thought and felt everything, everyone. The only thing missing was the obstetrician. To live, parlare. And they came to life at that moment, slapping me on the butt. I had to. It was necessary. After the teacher scolded me for being late, I thought of telling her my whole life story, my suffering, my victories and defeats leading up to that moment, but I couldn't get one word out. She let me sit down. But there was no place to sit. All the deaths were taken by those malevolent children, children of Lilith, by God or my mother, who should have omnisciently come to my rescue at that first threat, extended the hand of an angel, my Virgil, who always guided me, who chose to guide through difficulties. I think that this hand was illuminated by a celestial light. What, happens that it, what happiness that extended arm brought me it was Bernardo, whom my mother had brought, and to my good fortune was in my class, seated in the last desk, alone, anxiously awaiting my arrival. He directed me to sit beside him. I wanted to hug and kiss him and cry on his shoulder, true the day of my birth, the need to live, so unprotected. He was from this moment on my protector as well as my classmate, my bosom buddy, my blood brother, my brother. And side by side we stayed, changed. I never knew what Bernardo felt that day. Like, 
things. So maybe in English it sounds like differently as well. Can I just follow up on what you said to Antonio? Um, like, how, what connections are you making between mathematics and writing? Like, could you elaborate on? Uh, yes. So my PhD during my postdoc, as I am a mathematician, I wrote a dissertation on mathematics and literature. So I worked with uh, the works of Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer, and also Jorge Perret. And so they use like constraints, like restrictions, to uh, inside their literature. So, for example, Borges, for example, he uses like concepts, like infinite, like uh, numbers, like structures, and also uh, Jorge Perec. So I use it like some constraints. One of those constraints is the quotation, like citation. So I keep like stealing from the other authors. So, for example, he knows a lot of uh, like Portuguese literature, so he was able to to, to to find out the Fernando Pessoa's quotations. But there are like many others. So I try to use like this concept, like trying to, to show that my life is not like a new life. Uh, like other lives and other literatures, they have like the same uh, problems that I have. And I use like this mathematical thing to, to, to show like that. In a hidden way, you're right. Mm -hmm. So, two two questions. <laughs> it, how, in what way is it is your quotation model specifically mathematic? Is there is do you have uh, so many quotations per paragraph, or do you have like a formula that you follow per chapter? First question, and second question, building off the English translation. Do you have any ideas about the word but and alternative <laughs> translations? Because I think but and bonjinha don't really go together as well. So those are the first two question. Questions. Yeah, I have. I was like, I had to use like two quotations in each uh, chapter. So it was like my constraint. So I had to, you know, each chapter I have like uh, one chapter, for example, I, I talk. Uh, about the people that I don't like, you know, this guy you don't like, so doesn't like. So uh, it's like he's trying to make connections with the Divine Comedy, mm -hmm. because uh, Dante did the same. You know? uh, he used it like uh, he, he inserted people that he didn't like in the views of the of the. <laughs> Hell, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I did the same. So each chapter there is a connection with another uh, another literature. And the second one we have been discussing this, <laughs> which is the best word to, to translate. Uh, but like bonjinha, if it's but is a good one. Ass is another one. Booty is another one. <laughs> I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. I know. I noticed that there is a uh, uh, Kindle version for, uh, on, on Amazon. In yeah, but it's but in Portuguese. Right. So it's not. It's not. Portuguese. Not yet. So now, after the prize, I have an agent in Brazil, so she's trying to sell the rights here in the United States. But the the prize I was awarded in November, so it's a very new prize. So people are like discovering the book nowadays. So how is the, the connection or the relationship between the academic work and being a writer? So, so I'm doing, I, I, I'm finishing my postdoc in testimonials. So testimonials is like you, I, I, I have been researching the trauma writings. So people who experience like trauma situations, they they want to, to write and to tell their own story. So there are like a lot of problems in doing that because you can't access your memory. So here at MIT, at the Harvard, they have been studying this, this subject in neuroscience as well. So I think uh, if you like, you have those, 
those things, you know those concepts in literature, you are, you are able to use that in fiction. That's what I, I'm doing. This is my first novel. I'm going to publish another one, and I, I'm writing it the third one, so I keep like using my, the theories and the academic world to do my fiction. And fiction is much more uh, interesting, I think, because you can like, you can like, criticize people you don't like, right? <laughs> Explicit, just put the name, <laughs> and, then, and you can say that it's fiction, right? <laughs> You can't do that in a in an article, right? <laughs> you want to sometimes. <laughs> so are your characters based on real people? Yeah, some of them, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're gonna be a but then if you write something bad about you it will say no, it's just fiction. <laughs> it's just fiction. <laughs> So, but it's not a, a new thing. It's not something that I invented. It has been like they have been using this, those things like for the last two thousand years, maybe. <laughs> oh, what prompted your, your shift in focus between your undergraduate studies and your your graduate studies? Excuse me. Like what like made you like go from STEM to humanities? <laughs> It's complicated, <laughs> but I think uh, it was good, right? At the end. Uh, <laughs> Is it okay to say read the book? <laughs> oh, uh, read the book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 when it's translated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, you're studying Portuguese, so yeah. you, that, soon. you can download that. Amazon is like three dollars. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting to send like a million books. You know, if I send a million books, then I'm gonna make like three million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> So, like I said, I was award, awarded in November, so it's a very it's new very thing, you But know? even if so recent. Yeah, so people are, like, discovering, like, so they are, like, some critics in Brazil, they are writing, like, articles and new things about the book, so let's wait and see. Yes. <laughs> like I said, I want to sell one million books, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more, right? Yeah. <laughs> Used to it. Well, yeah. I am. <laughs>